Uh, Steve Coogan, thank you so much for joining us on Scotland tonight. So, um, Alan Partridge's tour has kicked off already. He's been around for 30 years now, over 30 years, and people you know, want to come and see him live. Why is he such a compelling character? Um, I, I'm not quite sure. So it's, um, I, I think it's people, because he's been around so long, he's sort of become part of the furniture in, in some ways. But he's also, I think he reflects the all aspects of the British in a way that is, um, you know, is objectionable, but he's also quite likable as well. He's not, he's just misinformed and, and ignorant, but not wicked. <laughs> and so people can sort of like him and uh, because he, he's sort of a buffoon, ultimately, but he's a buffoon that thinks. But he's got an enduring appeal and across the generations, because my teenage daughters absolutely, absolutely love him. Well, it's funny, I think, because he starts at 30 years, I think years ago, people used to look at him and think, there, but for the grace of God, go I. And, and uh, thank goodness I didn't say that, and thank goodness I've not made that faux pas. And, and I think you, the young, younger people, millennials and, and Gen Xs, as they call them, I think they see their, their parents' generation or their, they see uncles or, or their <laughs> teachers, so they la they're laughing at uh, sort of a, a, a generation above themselves. And so they, 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 they enjoy it in a slightly different way. Yeah. Do you find it really liberating playing them? Because, I mean, you've got a licence to say anything you want, really. Yeah, you, it, it, it's fun. It's fun because you can say things you wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't dream of saying as me. Um, but sometimes you, you enjoy saying it because it's quite mischievous. But you can say them because they're being seen in, their context, in, a, in a context, you know. Um, if he says something, you know, if, if, if you have a, a grandparent or, or, or a parent, an old parent who uh, says something that isn't quite up to speed with modern thinking, it's always quite funny, especially if they're trying hard to get with the programme, you know. Um, so I think, I, think, um, I think he is a great... It's, it's, it's enjoyable doing him, yeah. It's like it's a little Trojan horse. You can also... You can, some of the, most of the things Alan says are objectionable and funny because you shouldn't say them. And it's a sort of release valve, I think, for the audience to hear someone say it out loud and laugh at things. And the other part of it is you can sort of secretly say things that you might secretly agree with and sort of then you sort of hide under the, uh, under the <laughs> umbrella of Alan. Yeah. And so what can people expect from the show? Because he's sort of riding high at the moment and has a great deal of uh, um, hubris and confidence. And so he, he's getting a bit full of himself and he's going to sail too close to the sun. And uh, the show is really him, him sort of exercising his muscle. Now he's got a bit of a platform. Cause he's, he's, he, like, like all careers, it has highs and lows. And he's on a bit of a, 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 a wave at the moment. So um, we thought he would like, he, what he would do is go out and impart his wisdom to the world. So it's a lifestyle uh, guru who's uh, giving people advice on personal matters and helping the audience interpret the modern world. And, modern thinking and it, Adam, there's nothing he doesn't talk about diversity you know gender <laughs> politics oh, uh, everything you can think <laughs> of yeah. Alan Partridge talking about gender politics that I have to hear yeah yeah well you have to see the show <laughs> I couldn't possibly try and do him justice by doing it myself you understand and um, how does Alan Partridge cope with the kind of post me too movement this is my very clumsy way of getting into chivalry oh right uh, that your new channel 4 well, series uh, that um, is on yeah, the post yeah me I think too. Alan he does do that thing of uh, of trying to of people who are sort of getting up to speed with it sort of almost go too far the other way to demonstrate their on message woke credentials they sort of they say look 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 how woke I am you know and uh, he does that a bit where you think the lady doth protest too much I mean chivalry as I said it's on channel 4 it, it's very timely isn't it uh, yeah I think we I mean I wrote chivalry with Sarah Soleimani and we're both really proud of it because uh, but it is uh, no one the only dramas I'd seen that had really addressed gender politics um, were ones that were very, um, seemed to be important, adding their voice of support to the whole Me Too movement, which is important. But there wasn't really, um, you know, to, to, to look at truths about things, you have to use humour. And, and some people sometimes think that humour, if you use humour when you're talking about an important topic, that means you're trivialising it, or that might mean that you're not giving it respect. In actual fact, you can use humour to help people, 
You can use it in a pernicious way or you can use it in a way that actually illuminates things, helps people relax and helps you have a grown-up conversation about things. But because, uh, as, as Sarah said, uh, who, who I, I wrote it with, um, she, you know, the, the, there's this this um, movement that happened, this moment in our cultural history that became known as uh, Me Too, uh, where men had to shut up and listen. And um, th that, that in, in certain echelons of society, has happened. Not everywhere, of course, but certain uh, pivotal uh, uh, parts of, of society, in the media, that's been addressed. But that, that it's then what happens next? Because after that, there has to be a discussion um, a, a, a sort of a, a yeah a, a discussion between men and women, and all Sarah and I are doing with this comedy drama is trying to bring that to life um, through two characters. Uh, who one is you know unreconstructed middle-aged white man, the apotheosis of of of, of everything which is sort of uh, seen as um, the, the the root of all problems at the moment, and uh, and uh, Sarah plays a quite uh, an ardent uh, feminist. Um, as an actor and a writer, you're very engaged in politics and, and social issues. I just wanted to ask you, what do you make of where we are now in Britain in 2022? Do you think we're doing well as a country? Oh, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's in some ways less um, overtly political, you know, in, in, the same, in the old left and right way. I think that there are sort of... Uh, there are cultural differences that go across generations, and, and uh, you know, you, you, on the left or the right, you, you'll find different strains of thought on freedom of speech and on, you know, uh, woke politics and on gender gender politics, and there's um, a myriad of different views. Whichever, I, I think it's important that all these things are being discussed. I think. Um, Sometimes I wonder that in achieving change, uh, you're not. There's this danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That you can sort of, when when you improve one thing, there's a danger of actually um, uh, distorting or uh, damaging something else. Uh, so, it, you know, be, being cautious enlightenment, you know, is sort of the way the way to go. Um, what have you made of Boris Johnson and the whole Partygate debacle? The idea of the one rule for them and another for us, which is what Partygate is emblematic of, shows that he is, uh, does regard himself as one of them and d does think that different rules apply to him. He had a very privileged life. Why wouldn't he think other rules apply to him? Um, and that's something that does not go down well with the working people who gave him a chance. So I think he's kind of snookered because I think if he hangs on, uh, he'll pay for it, or his MPs will pay for it on the doorstep. And if he, he goes, then that's an admission of you know, a colossal error. But what about you know his defence and his supporters' defence? Uh, you know they say, well, in the great scheme of things, what does it matter? Breaking a few rules at the backdrop well, for, of for, Ukraine, the, well, the cost of living Well, so the crisis. Conservative Party has always uh, uh, championed itself as the party of law and order. That's what it's been for the last hundred years. It's sort of it's championed itself in that regard. And to say, well, it's OK if our, someone who introduced a law breaks those very laws, then it makes a mockery of everything they supposedly stand for. Um, in Scotland, we're, we're still all about constitutional mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. And I know before the mm -hmm. 2014 independence referendum, you came out and said, Scotland, stay in the UK. Do you still think that? Well, I think, no, I think too many things have changed, really. I, 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 now, I'm, now, I, now I don't... Now I, I've thought about that quite a lot, thinking, if, things, if that had happened now, would I think the same way? And I don't think I would. My my fear is that, uh, as a lay, as a sort of generic Labour supporter, that I, I want I would want as many votes as possible. And I always thought, well, if Labour recover in Scotland, then we could do with their votes uh, in, in England, mm -hmm. and so that's what I would miss. But I totally understand the desire for it now, and especially after Brexit and the fact that Scotland is a. You know, and it seems to makes Britain look insular. Sorry, England look insular and inward-looking, mm -hmm. and that's not. You know, it's there are some wonderful things about um, uh, England, and, I, and I, I like to think of myself as being British rather than English, and I like that. And that that's something that I. It's like <clears throat> I almost feel like my regret about if Scotland left would be 
people like who have my worldview need Scotland to help us, to help our to help my country, if, you, if that makes sense. And without them, I feel like you know we, it, it's all over. It feels like well, at least you know because a lot of people, especially people. Um, the anti-establishment English people look to Scotland and go, we need those people. So that's the sort of the, the caveat that I'd put in, in, into the conversation. But whilst, whilst I fully understand, I mean, I, I wouldn't blame, in some ways, and in some ways I feel like, you know, uh, uh, the, the rap on the knuckles of, of Scotland leaving would be sort of well-deserved um, uh, for, the, for after Brexit. So, but that's not a particularly constructive way of thinking. <laughs> Just one last question. Sure. Um, Back in Edinburgh, and I know that you you won the Perry Award in '92. Is that right? Years ago, yeah. But you, I think you had a disastrous start in 1990. But overall, do you have great memories? Of I Edinburgh? do have great memories. It's funny enough. I I came here in eight, 1988. The first time I came here, uh, a, a very young-ish then. And uh, came, and but in I, I did the, the Edinburgh with Frank Skinner in 1990, and I wasn't particularly on my game, and I got these terrible reviews. And funny enough. I, the other day I went online, I thought, I wonder if I can find that review from 30 years ago that really slagged me off. And, and, I, uh, and I sort of tracked it down and, and, uh, <laughs> to the list, the Edinburgh list. And, and uh, I, I, read, I hadn't read it for 30 years, and I thought, oh, God, that right. That, I remember that stings. When you're 23 years old, you know, it's sort of, you, I thought it was quite young. You sort of, but my overall, I, I mean, I just made a film in Scotland last year with uh, Sally Hawkins about Philippa Langley, who lives here, uh, uh, about, uh, who found the body of Richard III in a Leicester car park. And I loved being back here and spending time here. And uh, all the, I, I regularly, uh, you know, I went the, the festival in 92. Um, you know, I was working with Patrick Marber and Stuart Lee and, uh, um, and some Richard Herring and uh, John Thompson. And it, it, was, uh, it was a very magical time. So, and, and also it's sort of, it's where, there's something we're really pioneering about the festival where people can be really expressive and experimental and you feel like you're sort of wrapped in cotton wool and people are supportive of you. It's not, it's not the big wide world, but uh, it feels like the world. And when, I mean, when I won the, the, what was then known as the Perrier Award, Fringe Award in 1992, I mean, that was, that's more, I mean, I've, I'm very privileged to have won lots of awards since then, BAFTAs and things. And, uh, uh, but none of them was as exciting as winning that Fringe Award in 1992. That was the most exciting time it's, of my life. It stayed with you, the yeah. excitement. Yeah. Oh, well, um, thank you very much indeed for joining us in Scotland tonight. Good luck with the rest of the tour. Thanks, Rowan. Thank you.